Good afternoon, everyone. Did I scare you? <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. My name is Ivan Polinkala, and it is my pleasure to serve as the Dean of the College of the Arts here at KSU. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. We are making history this afternoon as we start what we hope will be an annual lecture series in the arts. Here at KSU, we really believe in a few things that are really important to art education. Number one, the marriage of both theory and practice. And number two, the importance of the arts being relevant to other disciplines. And all of the interdisciplinary work we do here in the college is intended to build to that goal. And this afternoon, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce to you Dr. Anjan Chatterjee. I think you're going to see from his lecture this afternoon that his work captures what I just shared with you in a really powerful way. And so, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Anjan Chatterjee. Uh, Dr. Jessica Stevenson is going to introduce him. Thank you, Thank you so much, Ivan. So, um, needless to say, Dr. Chatterjee's accomplishments are vast, and I'm going to give just a, a snippet of, of what he has done. So Dr. Andran Chatterjee is professor, professor of Neurology, Psychology, and Architecture, and the founding director of the Penn Center for Neuroaesthetics. He is a member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, and the Center for Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his BA in philosophy, I love that, from Haverford College, an MD from the University of Pennsylvania, and he completed his neurology residence at the University of Chicago. He is the past chair of neurology at Pennsylvania Hospital. Dr. Chatterjee's clinical practices focus on patients with cognitive disorders. His groundbreaking research addresses questions about neuroaesthetics, spatial cognition, and language, as well as neuroethics. He's written many books, including The Aesthetic Brain, How We Evolved to Desire Beauty and Enjoy Art. He also co-edited Neuroaesthetics in Practice, Mind, Medicine, and Society. He is or has been on numerous editorial boards, for example, Empirical Studies of the Arts, Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, Journal, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, and the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity, and the Arts. He was awarded the Norman Geschwind Prize in Behavioral and Cognitive Neurology by the American Academy of Neurology and the Rudolf Arnheim Prize for Contributions to Psychology and the Arts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chatterjee, a pioneer in the field of neuroaesthetics, as he shares with us today aspects of his research in a lecture titled, The Aesthetic Brain. Dr. Chatterjee. Can everybody hear me in the back? Um, I give talks quite frequently, but I can't remember ever in an introduction um, the comment being made that we're making history. <laughs> so <laughs> the pressure is on. Uh, um, I'm very honored to be here uh, and to kick off this, this program uh, that uh, I think uh, the sort of intersection of art and science uh, is a fascinating one. Uh, over the years, you can think of various luminaries uh, in the sciences that have been interested in the arts. Uh, as, a, as a neurologist and neuroscientist, uh, probably uh, at the turn of the century, the turn of the last century, Ramon E. Cajal, uh, some of you may know, is the person who's best known uh, for the neuron doctrine. He's the person who, who thought that individual nerve cells were uh, the unit of the brain. Uh, he was also an artist. In fact, he wanted to be an artist. He drew, uh, but his parents uh, decided he needed to do something more uh, conventional, and so he became a physician, but loved uh, 
uh, drawing out most of his observations. So there's this kind of long tradition uh, of this uh, intersection between science and the arts and particularly people interested in neuroscience. So the way this talk is going to be organized is that the first part will be just some framing uh, slides for this field, neuroesthetics, which is uh, quite a new field. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, our center is doing. And we're focused on vision. Uh, one doesn't have to stay with vision. You can think of music, you can think of food, you can think of uh, fragrances that one can have aesthetic experiences, you can think of movement, one can have aesthetic experiences through these different kinds of modalities, but we're focused on vision. And the way the visual system, our occipital cortex, carves out the world is into people, places, and things. And so with each of these, uh, I'm going to uh, touch on some of the work that uh, we, uh, we are doing with respect to the aesthetic experiences of people, places, and things. So you might wonder why in a, in a talk about aesthetics, I would start with the image of this somewhat dour looking gentleman. Um, his name is Gustav Feschner. He lived in the second half of the, the 19th century. And it's very hard to talk about empirical aesthetics without going back to him. He's pretty much regarded as the founder of empirical aesthetics. And the claim is on October 22nd in 18, uh, in 1850, uh, he woke up uh, with this epiphany. And the precision of this date uh, makes me think it's probably apocryphal, but nonetheless, he thought that uh, he had been thinking about some of some of the psychological work that had been done before. And he came up with this insight that properties of the world are systematically related to properties of the mind. That there wasn't this big disconnection between the mind and the world and these properties uh, were related and it could actually be described mathematically and came up with what was referred to or still is referred to as Feschner's law. So that was his first insight. His second insight was that if this were true, this proposition that properties of the world are systematically related to properties of the mind, it had to be mediated through the nervous system. And he recognized at the time that technology wasn't there in order to, um, to address this. And so he talked about the fact that there was an outer psychophysics, which is, and he's also known as the father of psychophysics, uh, but there also had to be an inner psychophysics in which properties of the nervous system were systematically related to properties of the mind. But, but, but recognize that that would be uh, something for the future. And then his third insight, which led into a book that was published in uh, 1876, I think, uh, which has never been translated it into English, uh, on empirical aesthetics. And there what he suggested was that one could have a programmatic approach to aesthetics that he described as being from below as opposed to from above. And by that he meant that one could actually run experiments that rather than operating simply on the basis of first principles uh, of how aesthetics should be, one could actually find out what do people like, what's common, what's not. Uh, and that if you approached aesthetics from below, where that met in aesthetics from above, there could be interesting things happening. So in some ways, neuroesthetics is cashing out these three propositions that, that Feschner uh, articulated in the second half of the 19th century, which is properties of the world are systematically related to properties of the mind. This has to be mediated through the nervous system, and one can have a programmatic uh, research program uh, uh, inquiring uh, about the nature of aesthetic experiences. And just to carve out the domain, uh, there is a, uh, one can think of a cognitive neuroscience of aesthetics and a cognitive neuroscience of art. These are, they can overlap, but they're not isomorphic. You can have an aesthetic experience of uh, say a, a landscape or a beautiful uh, sunset, which might not be of art. Uh, and within that, there's a cognitive neuroscience of beauty, which overlaps both these domains, uh, in which the, for, there's been more work done in the cognitive neuroscience of beauty, but there are other kinds of aesthetic experiences that are not simply beauty. And the field is just starting to, uh, to approach some of these kinds of questions. 
Um, so when you take a domain that is so uh, baggy and uh, so uh, potentially vague, as a scientist, we're always thinking, how do we, how do we operationalize this? How do we carve this up uh, into uh, discrete bits so that one can start approaching this systematically? And so this is uh, a general framework that uh, Ocean Vartanian, who's in Toronto, and I have written about in several papers. Uh, which is to talk about uh, these three large-scale neural systems, which has to do with the nature of our sensory and motor systems, uh, the nature of the emotional experience, which uh, when we're typically thinking about beauty, we think about reward, which is that these are rewarding experiences, but there can be other kinds of uh, experiences, and the way in which knowledge and meaning uh, modulates this. And just to give you some, a concrete example, a, a sort of trivial example of the, the way in which our, the design of our sensory and motor systems constrains the kind of aesthetic experiences you can have, is that if, again, going back to the sunset example, there's all sorts of infrared energy that's being produced at that time, and we don't have the receptors to apprehend infrared spectrum of light. And so whatever is out there in, the nature, in nature that might be part of an aesthetic experience for us is constrained by the design of our nervous system as a sort of a trivial example, but I'll come back to this later. Just to give you a sense of how uh, young this field is, uh, this is a PubMed search. Uh, this goes to 2018. In the next few months, I'll add to um, 2019, uh, but this is a, a, a search looking at neuroesthetics or neuroscience or neuropsychology and art, neuroscience and neuro, or neuropsychology and beauty, and these are the number of publications. Uh, and you can see that virtually nothing uh, before the turn of the century. And then around 20, uh, around 2000, eight to 10, there seems to be an inflection point where the, the number of uh, publications are, uh, are accelerating. Now one point about this, uh, and especially for the students, students in the audience, is that this is a field that is sufficiently young that the big questions have not been addressed. Almost always when I give these talks, people will ask questions and my response will be, that's a great question, nobody's done the experiment. So there are a lot of low-hanging fruit in this field. Uh, you know, this is not one where we're really debating minutia. There are like big, big questions that remain unanswered. Okay, so people often, uh, one uh, common question I get uh, when I talk about this is people will always say, well, beauty is in the brain, is in the eyes of the beholder, right? And the implication of that is that it must be so variable that one can't actually study this uh, systematically. And my, my kind of standard glib response to that is that really beauty is in the brain of the beho beholder and our brains are more similar than they're different. And the way in which this gets cashed out, and this is a, an example of a paper that looked at, uh, if we're asking the question of beauty, what are we talking about? So if you ask the question of which faces do people find beautiful or attractive, turns out there's a great deal of consistency across people, across cultures. In fact, infants will look at faces that adults think are beautiful for longer than they look at other faces. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum is art, that there's very little consistency in what art people find beautiful. Uh, and then if you look at natural landscapes, people are pretty consistent, not quite as consistent as faces, uh, but really quite consistent. And then if you look at architecture, both interiors and exteriors, people are less consistent uh, and you can think of architecture almost as a manufactured landscape. So it falls in between natural landscapes and artworks. And so the big picture we get out of this is that natural kinds, meaning faces and natural landscapes, we tend to be fairly consistent in the kinds of, um, kinds of uh, faces and places that we find attractive, but 
artifacts, we tend to be least consistent. And going back to this aesthetic triad that I talked about, this is where the, the, um, this top uh, bit, knowledge and meaning, has a tremendous impact, uh, which is, this is what accounts for the variability in people's responses, uh, and that that's, you know, as a scientist, we're always trying to understand what's the structure and variability. And so the way our personal experiences, our personal histories, our education, the point and place and time that we happen to grow up has a much greater effect on artifacts, whether it's architecture or art, than it does on natural kinds like faces and places. So with that in mind, uh, we're gonna um, talk about beauty and beauty in the context of faces. And this is an experiment we did uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. And basically the question being, what is going on in our brains when we look at faces that we think uh, are attractive? And in this experiment, people came in, uh, this is an fMRI experiment. Um, and just to be clear, this is where people are lying in a scanner and what we're measuring is really blood flow as a, as a proxy for how their nerves are firing. And the basic trick is that blood, when, as you all know, has hemoglobin, when it is oxygenate, oxygenated, it has a different magnetic property. And so you can tell, very clever people have figured out how to use magnetic resonance imaging to tell when there are minute changes in blood flow. So that's the basic trick to what all fMRI is. Okay, and it's a proxy. If you have more neurons firing, you get more blood in that area. So this is an experiment where we had people come in on two different sessions. In one, they're looking at these faces. These are all digitized faces where they have to say, you know, is this face more attractive than another one? And in another situation, they're making an identity judgment. Have I seen this face before or not? So in the identity judgment, we're not asking about any kind of value. We're not saying, is this beautiful or not? Just, do you recognize this person? Have you seen this person before or not? And it's not people from their personal lives. It's if they've seen this image before in the set of faces that we're showing. So what we find turns out to be quite interesting. And just to uh, uh, orient you, let's just focus on the bottom panel. <coughs> If you look at the left uh, where there are the blue, yellow, and red patches, the, the, um, the yellow patch is an area in the brain called the fusiform gyrus, which is, seems to be especially tuned to processing faces. The red area is in, within an area of the brain called the parahippocampus, uh, which is specialized in processing places, and the blue tends to do things more general. So when I said people, places, and things, this is how the visual cortex carves out our visual world. So what we find, now if you look at the middle panel, uh, or the middle image in the bottom panel, what we see is that within occipital cortex, this is the back of our brain, what we're looking is under, from the underbelly of the brain, uh, at the bottom is the back of the brain, uh, what we see is that neural activity in that area varies parametrically with how attractive the face is. So more attractive the face, the greater the neural activity in our visual system. But it's not generalized because we don't get this in the area that is responsive to places. Now, it's worth keeping in mind uh, that the design of the brain didn't have to be this way. If I had come up here and told you that the back of the brain classifies objects like I already have, and the front of the brain imposes value on these objects, that would be a perfectly reasonable way to think about how this system might be organized. But what this tells us is vision and valuation are so tightly linked that even early in our visual streams, already starting to impose value on what we're looking at. The second part of this uh, observation that's relevant is if you look at the right side, uh, 
This is when people are making this familiarity judgment. So they're not making a value judgment. They're just saying, I've seen this face before, I haven't. And we get the exact same kind of modulation in their visual cortex to how attractive the faces are, even though that's not on the table for them to address. And so one implication of this observation is that our visual system is responding to beauty whether or not one is thinking about it or whether or not one is explicitly being, this is being addressed. So as though there's this automatic response to beauty. And we'll come back to that point. Um, around the same time, another group uh, did a very similar study and in their condition, which was a non-evaluative one, they're just deciding if these faces are longer or broader. So it's again a perceptual task. And what they find in the front of the brain uh, in some of these classic reward areas, that there is also neural activity when people are making a perception judgment uh, in addition or independent of when they make the evaluation judgment. So again, we take both of these observations that were made within a, a year or two of each other. And the implication is that our reward systems and our visual systems are tightly linked, responding to beauty, even when we're not explicitly thinking about beauty. Okay, so that's the main point out of this. So if our brains are automatically responding to beauty, one question is, does this express itself in behavior in any way? So this is an experiment I did with some collaborators in, um, in Singapore. It's a very simple experiment. People are sitting, it's a behavioral experiment. People are looking at a computer screen. Uh, they start with the mouse at the lower number. All they have to do is move the mouse to whichever number at the top is closer to the lower number and just click on it, okay? The trick of the experiment is that next to these numbers are faces uh, and these faces we've normed for being uh, attractive, average looking, or at the lower end of the attractive spectrum. And these are all within the range of generally normal, normal looking people. There are no, there are no supermodels in this uh, set. Uh, and so, but our question is, if I'm moving to this side, and everybody can do the task, it's very easy. If I'm moving to this side, and the attractive face is over here, does it affect how my limb moves? And that is essentially what we find, is that people's arms, their limbs, as they're just moving along to click the number, their hands are attracted. Attraction turns out is not really a metaphor in this sense, that it's almost as though there's a magnetic pull towards the attractive face. People are not aware of doing this but this is what happens. And so it seems to suggest that there is a kind of uh, automaticity to our response to this kind of beauty. Um, this is a, a complicated slide, uh, but it's to make a relatively simple point, which is that we also track people's eye movements. And what we find, unlike the limb movements, the eyes will go to the attractive face as well, similar to the limb movements. But the eyes also go to the, the, the faces at the lower end of attraction when compared to average faces in a way that the limb doesn't do that. So what our eyes are doing is something we think is different, which is orienting to stimuli that are at the extremes, very attractive and unattractive whereas our limbs are only moving towards the, the attractive ones. And it is worth keeping in mind that this information, this exact same information coming into people's visual cortex, and that signal is being sent out to the motor system, but it's a different signal or it's a different call to action if it's going to the limb or it's going to the eyes uh, to kind of give you a sense of how nuanced some of these effects can be. The eyes look at extremes, the limbs move towards what's attractive. So given this automaticity, um, this comes with certain social consequences, uh, which is that 
there is something that is referred to as the beauty is good stereotype. And this is something that social psychologists have observed uh, and documented uh, for a number of years, which is that attractive people get, uh, are hired more easily, get better pay. If they commit crimes, they are given less, lesser punishments. Attractive students, unless they're standardized tests, are given higher grades. Uh, there is this kind of, uh, you can think of attraction in the list of unearned privileges that people, people have. Uh, and it, the, the observations of this are quite clear. It turns out uh, there have been a handful of studies. Uh, these, these, this is not from my lab, but it's one of about six studies that have been published in the last, uh, last seven or eight years uh, where people are in a scanner and in one condition they're making a judgment again of whether the faces are attractive. In another condition, they're looking at these little vignettes, in this case they were shown as uh, in cartoons, and they're just making a judgment of is this a morally good act? And in this case, what's being shown is that there is a girl who's helping a blind person go down the stairs, right? Most of us would say, yeah, that's a morally good act. And um, what they find is that in the front of the brain, in the underbelly of the brain, in uh, an area called the orbitofrontal cortex, which is a classic reward area, that there is a, a part of this in which these values, when people are making these judgments, uh, that the, the neural response is uh, conflated in the same area. Now there are other parts of the brain where they're different, but it at least suggests that there might be within our brain a part of our reward systems that is really not very specific, right? It's good, it's good in terms of how something looks, it good, it's good in terms of its morality, and that might be the biologic anchor in which this beauty is good stereotype uh, gets cashed out. So we took this observation and went in a slightly different direction um, to ask is there, uh, and this is in the context of being in a, in a medical environment, uh, is there uh, an unfortunate corollary to the beauty is good stereotype, which would be, do people who have facial anomalies, is there a facial anomaly is bad bias that people have? So this could be from scars, it could be birthmarks, it could be uh, skin cancers, it could be developmental abnormalities. Uh, and so this uh, is a, uh, we started to look at this and it turns out that um, people uh, unfortunately do attribute negative personality characteristics just based on these slight facial flaws. So people uh, with these kinds of anomalies are, are regarded as less competent, less intelligent, less trustworthy, less uh, hardworking, and so on. Um, I'll skip this. Um, now it turns out, as you will recognize, that this is a trope that's used commonly in popular culture in our movies, right? That it's an easy way for Hollywood to say, this is a bad person without having to give you a big backstory, right? So these kinds of, there is a, a reification of this idea that, uh, that is promulgated by uh, by popular movies, uh, so much so that even, you know, in one of the most uh, all-time popular movies for kids, The Lion King, if, uh, if you think about it, the villain in The Lion King is named Scar, right? It's the only character in the whole, whole story that is named by its facial feature. Right? Every other character has a name. And so this is the message we're giving our three and four year olds um, through, through popular media. So we, we wanted to look at this in a little more detail and this is something that's called the implicit association test. Uh, it's been used a lot in, uh, in race studies uh, and some in gender bias studies, but we looked at the same thing. And the task is a, again, a very simple one, which is people are shown faces, they respond in one direction. If it's a typical face, they respond in another direction if it's an uh, anomalous face. Very easy. 
And then they also look at words and they respond in one direction if it's a positive word like happy, in another direction if it's a negative word like pain. And since I already told you in the previous experiment that our values sometimes get cashed out in how our limbs are moving, that's also assumed over here, which is that if someone has a negative association with a certain kind of face, and their mo the, the movement to classifying that face and to the negative word is in the same direction, people are a little faster than if it's in the other direction. There's no association, it shouldn't matter, it should just be random. Um, and we also ask people explicitly, do you think you have a bias against people who have these kinds of facial anomalies? People explicitly say no, uh, but when we look at their, uh, the, the effect size of this implicit bias based on the, the rapidity of their response, you get a very robust, um, um, uh, implicit bias, negative bias towards uh, individuals with facial anomalies. For what it's worth, this bias is uh, much more robust and we've replicated this among men viewers than uh, among women viewers, which we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, it also turns out um, that if you look at people's own biases uh, or their self reports of their own bias versus the effect size on these implicit association tests, there's zero correlation. So one, and now this is me stepping outside of these data uh, as a public service announcement is, I think one implication of these kinds of data is that we all, everyone in this room, harbors implicit negative biases to something. It may be different, but we probably all harbor negative implicit biases and we are the worst judges of our own implicit bias. Okay. Um, so what's going on in the brain uh, when people uh, are looking at these kinds of faces? And so this is an experiment we did where people are just looking at the faces, they're just making a, gen uh, a sex judgment. Is, I think this is a man, I think this is a woman. What we find again in the back of the brain if you look at the bottom left panel, there's more activity to these anomalous faces than there is to typical faces. And it's in the same area, approximately the same area as that first study I showed you with attractive faces. So we now think that this activity in our visual cortex is not a beauty response, which is what I thought 10 years ago, but going back to that vigilance, it's a, it's a response to things that are extremes. Our visual system is just looking out and paying attention to things that are extreme. So it's not a, we don't think it's a beauty response. In some ways, more interesting is if you look at the middle top panel where there's the green in the front, inside in the middle of the brain where there's decreased neural activity when people are looking at uh, these anomalous faces uh, versus typical faces. Now this is not something we were expecting, uh, uh, but the effects were really quite robust. And this is an area of the brain that seems very important for a whole lot of social aspects of how we interact with other people. Uh, there is a, a kind of self and other. The more you think someone is within your group, you have greater activity in this area. This is some, an area when people are put in conditions of empathy, you get greater activity. And what we're seeing is that in response to, you're not asked, all you're saying is I think that's a man, I think that's a woman. When people are looking at these kinds of anomalous faces, this area of the brain that instantiates our sense of empathy of belonging to another gets decreased. And uh, we have, other people have suggested this, that this might be uh, a biological marker for a kind of dehumanization. And so we are now trying to understand what that means. Uh, and this is just, a, and this is preliminary data for a follow-up study, which we're in the process of, or of uh, analyzing. Uh, but we're trying to ask this question of what, what makes, wh what is it about us, all of us, and our differences that makes us more likely to have this kind of response. 
And so what I'm showing in the top right is we're using these kinds of dispositional surveys from uh, social neuroscience, from social psychology, uh, and that there is something called the uh, three dimensions of disgust, that we all have varying degrees of how disgusting we find certain things. Uh, and that people who score highly on this uh, tend to have a greater response within part of the reward systems to these kinds of faces. And so this is just a taste of something that we're now programmatically trying to dissect. What, what is it about the faces and what is it about the viewers that makes us have these kinds of responses? So stay tuned uh, over the next few years. So that's a kind of story about people. And the, the broader thing that we're interested in is what is the nature, what is the relationship between beauty and morality and how does that get expressed in the world? So that's, that's the first question. So moving on to places, uh, you know, the, this general idea that our environment uh, has a big impact on our well-being. And is that something we can uh, get a handle on? Uh, some of you may recognize this. This is uh, Sagrada Familia. This is in Barcelona. It's this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, cathedral by Gaudi. Uh, and, you know, so, th so the question is, how do you try to address what our environment, how our environment has an effect on our, uh, on our emotional states? So you can go back again, this is to um, the first century, uh, this is Vitruvius. He was a Roman soldier who was also an architect. He actually wrote a 10 volume treatise on architecture, uh, which often gets reduced to his triad, which he thought this was important for architectural design, which was the structural strength of buildings, its functionality. And then he had a separate uh, emphasis on aesthetics. And a lot of um, sort of mid, 20th century uh, architecture, Western architecture, sort of conflated functionality and aesthetics, which is that if, you know, aesthetics is how well a building functions, but that's starting to, to separate out again. And uh, so, you know, we're interested in exploding this aesthetics piece, again, based on uh, the aesthetic triad that uh, we have been working on. So, Here's another question. You've got this very complicated thing, which is architectural interiors. How do you even begin to study this? So we collaborated with some architects uh, that were in Denmark and collected a bunch of these stimuli. There are 200 images of architectural interiors, and we just wanted them to vary on three dimensions that apply to all interiors, which is how high or low are the ceilings, like this would be a room with a high ceiling. Uh, is the interior more curvilinear or rectilinear? This would be more curvilinear. And is it closed or open? And by open, we mean that you can look past the room. There's a window that looks beyond that or a panel or a, or a door or something like that. So this would be a closed room. Uh, and we, at the time, we were asking a very simple question, which is when people prefer interiors, uh, is the reward system in our brains active in the same way they are with faces? And this is, um, this is really a, a prelude to the story I want to tell you. This was uh, published a few years ago, and basically the answer is yes, that within, again, the middle part of the front of the brain, within some classic reward areas, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, there is increased neural activity to, uh, to places, uh, to these interiors that people find attractive. Again, the, the general idea is that our reward systems tends, tend to be not very specific, right? That they're responding to faces, they're responding to, uh, to architectural interiors as well. So we then followed up, um, and I should, um, there's a caveat I want to be very clear about, right? When people are in scanners, when we're doing these kinds of fMRI studies, people are lying absolutely still on their back. 
right? So on first principles, you'd say this is ridiculous that you would study architecture, which is all about moving in spaces, looking, you know, completely still, looking at these kinds of images. So accepted, and yet we find sort of interesting and comprehensible um, findings. So we took those same 200 images and uh, combed through the literature for a variety of psychological dimensions that have been used in both environmental aesthetics and architectural aesthetics, uh, and did a massive online study with uh, 800 participants. Uh, and basically, uh, these are ways of looking at how similar are people in their responses to these kinds of images. Uh, and so on the left, uh, what we're showing is a correlation matrix. And then we use two specific analytic techniques to try to reduce this into something that's a little more graspable, is a little more comprehensible. Uh, and this is something that is um, referred to as semantic network analysis. And I confess to not understanding all of the math that goes behind this. This is what you hire postdocs for. <laughs> but there is a way in which you can start spatially organizing this information. Uh, and in this jargon, this would say that there are three communities of responses. Uh, and right in the center of that is balance, which is the basic question of whether uh, you feel good or you don't feel good. And it, what it looks like is that these three communities uh, we're calling coherent, which is when you look at a space, how coherent does it feel? Fascination, like do you feel like you want to explore it? And hominess, which is do you feel comfortable, do you feel like you own the space, that you, are, you belong in that space? And these three are orthogonal to each other, meaning that just like how a space rates on one does not predict how it rates on the other. And you can start thinking of all of your spaces, go home, go wherever you teach, go to your classrooms and start thinking of does, how does the space rate on these three uh, ways of thinking about a space. And then we do a more conventional kind of analysis called principal component analysis and we get the same uh, three components uh, as we do with this other analysis. So, uh, and then because this is the first time we did it, we redo it in another sample, we get the same results. So we feel fairly confident that this uh, matters psychologically, but does it matter in the brain? So we go back to the fMRI study that I showed you that was published in, uh, in 2013. And they, those participants looked at exactly the same images as we used over here. That was a study that was done in Tenerife, Spain. All of these data were collected in the US. Okay, so different population. Uh, but we ask the question is if we go back to the original fMRI data and reanalyze it based on these principal components, which we did not know at the time the data was collected, nor did our participants know we were interested in this. What we end up finding is that within our occipital cortex that our visual system does seem to differentiate along these three dimensions of fascination, hominess, and coherence. And there are a few nuances to it, which I can go into if you want, but for us, this was in some ways further validation that these are three very important components of how we react to architectural interiors. They, there may be others, but this, these seem to be important. Now, one practical consequence of all of this is, uh, is that I have been involved with um, an architectural firm in Philadelphia called Ewing Cole, where we are designing a memory residential care unit from the ground up. And this is a true collaboration of w the way architects think of spaces and the way people who do my kind of work think about spaces. And, ha and, and the, the broader question is, what's the relationship between our built environment and our sense of well-being, and how do you moderate, how do you modify that in particular populations? 
So in people that have short-term memory problems that tend to wander, how do you, how do you let the environment allow them to flourish as much as possible using some of these kinds of principles? And so this is uh, kind of a mock-up of the design we're working on. Uh, so one example is it's a circular structure. So what, uh, you know, since people going back to the sort of motor systems involved, people with these kinds of uh, short-term memory problems often like to wander. And what we typically do in most places is we have locked units. You don't want them to wander. You don't want them to go out. And our idea is, no, let them, let them walk as much as they want. There's a circular corridor they can walk as much as they want, they'll get tired, they'll sleep better, they'll eat more, so on and so forth. And we've been using some of these principles in this design uh, to think through like what would the space mean, both in terms of coherence, so that they don't feel disoriented, uh, enough fascination so that they're stimulated but not overstimulated, and that there is a quality of hominess so it doesn't feel institutional. When you're putting in your mother or your father or your spouse, that it f you feel comfortable about this. So this is an ongoing project, uh, which we've been in the design process for about a year, uh, and hopefully in a year and a half from now, this will be, uh, will be done, and that I'm gonna have a research office at the place where we hope to continue to collect qualitative data there uh, for some of these effects. So last bit, uh, as I said, people, places, and things. In this case, we're gonna talk about art. Uh, things can be the design of objects, and we're, uh, in this case, looking at art. And here the question is, what is the nature of aesthetic engagement? Why do we look at splatters of paint or whatever uh, it is, and what is the nature of this engagement? And so we, we tried to do this in a very, for this experiment, in a very specific way, which is some people have argued uh, that part of the engagement is our whole body, our motor systems get engaged uh, in, uh, in what we're looking at. So we took, uh, we wanted this in a fairly constrained way, uh, which is we looked at a series of uh, images of paintings by Mondrian uh, and by Jackson Pollock. And the idea was that these are all abstract they're not representational, so people's, if some people might like portraits, some people might like landscapes, so we kind of eliminate any of those kind of differences. There's this, these images are not, at least in an obvious sense, representing anything, uh, but the Pollocks have much more movement in them than the Mondrians, which tend to be static. And the way of looking at this was to look at uh, a group of people with Parkinson's disease. And the idea there is if our motor systems are important in the nature of aesthetic engagement and you have a problem in your motor system, does this affect the nature of your aesthetic engagement? Right, a straightforward sort of kind of question. So. First, what we do is we rate these uh, paintings uh, using large groups of uh, healthy individuals and age match individuals to see uh, if our intuitions are correct. And it does turn out that there seems to be this very lovely bimodal distribution. The Mondrians are all considered more static. The Pollocks are all considered to have much more in the way of uh, implied motion. Uh, we took 30 people uh, with Parkinson's disease and uh, kind of went through this. Uh, and we also asked a variety of other things like uh, beauty, liking, balance, and all. And this, these are, again, unpublished data, which we're working through right now. So first thing, again, a kind of busy slide, but all I would like to point you to is on the right, uh, where you see the greenish-blue line that's the response of people with Parkinson's disease. And what it looks like is their whole scale of how they rate the amount of movement in these paintings is compressed. They don't use the whole range, that, that just the range of how they apprehend motion. So we're already seeing there is an effect of their disease that affects their motor system and how they're even perceiving these kinds of paintings. And this ends up I think uh, the money slide for us. 
which is that when you ask the question of their perceptions of beauty in the paintings or their liking of the paintings, and the paintings are uh, organized by how much movement there is, so this is shown in the top left and the top right, you see there's a blunting of response, which is it's not that they're oblivious to the amount of movement, but they never quite peak at the same level of liking or perception of beauty based on movement as age-matched healthy controls. But the story ends up being a little more, uh, it, in my view, more interesting because if you look at the same analysis and compare it to how complex the images are, the people with Parkinson's are indistinguishable from healthy controls. So it's not as though they don't have aesthetic experiences, but it's the piece, you know, going back to the original triad, the piece of aesthetic experiences which is contingent on a motor system is what's blunted, but the rest of their system seems to be, uh, seems to be working fine, at least uh, when we probe for notions of visual complexity, they seem to be do fine. And so again, it makes for a more nuanced uh, view of aesthetic experiences that there are all of these different ways in which converging information contributes to our experiences and then we can try to dissect these out uh, using these kinds of populations. Uh, the last thing is just to allude to the fact that uh, uh, in our interest in art and you know the big question that we hope to really get at um, is you know what, what are the arts good for? Right? You guys this is this is a fundamental question that I think your school is you know probably and as most people who love arts uh, grapple with but um, you know in Philadelphia as is true in many places as soon as there are budget cuts in the public schools the first thing to go are uh, are music and the arts right so I think it's incumbent on us to make the case of why arts matter and not and to make the case to the people who don't believe it matters right so that's part of the the broader agenda uh, uh, but also to, for, for me as a scientist to use uh, arts and the artists to kind of help with us to think through different things. And so we, we also right now have, a, uh, in my lab, we have an artist uh, in residence who is interested in the nature of memory. And uh, you know, he attends all of my lab meetings, contributes to all of our discussions from uh, his vantage point, which is quite different than, uh, than other people in the lab. I have an art historian who comes uh, regularly to my lab meetings. Uh, and we are in the process of trying to uh, design a joint exhibit uh, of, uh, on uh, questions on the nature and ambiguity of memory and recollections uh, in a way that he's pushing our thinking and we're pushing his thinking. Uh, and you know, with the general belief that this will make uh, both of our work better. So. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That covered a, a vast swath of material. So we're going to open up the floor to questions. And if you have any questions, if you would stand up and, and just speak up. Yes, sir. Uh, this is really kind of one and a half two questions. Uh, the first one is, I'm a firm believer that someone with no artistic inclination, left on a desert island by himself, one of the first things they'll do is take a stick and draw the sand. Um, I'm curious about whether one would have to consider taking an experiment where someone might be able to try to develop a study of experiences for some time to see how long that might, or if that might manifest. The other question I have is since there's French work that's been fascinated by the region, uh, aesthetic chills would have an equivalent in English where uh, people, only some people, get a response where they get goosebumps or get a little raise in the arms, or uh, typically over music. Yeah, so two questions. The first one is uh, um, 
bereft of any stimulation, do people have an aesthetic impulse of some kind, right? Is that a fair restatement of it? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's sort of the experiment that you can't really do. <laughs> At least no IRB will let you do it. Um, the, uh, you know, but, but you, one way to try to get at this is to look back in history. Uh, and uh, as far as we can tell, and uh, there's a section of my book where I talk about this, as far back as you can find any evidence of humans and pre-humans, uh, homo species, there are, the decorative impulse seems to be profound. Uh, there are uh, caves, uh, you would know better than I probably in South Africa, the Blombos Caves, where there are, uh, there are uh, records from 80,000 years ago of the use of ochre uh, as, uh, that's used decoratively in a way that just doesn't have any practical significance. And that there was a bead culture uh, that you know, goes back 100,000 years ago to North Africa and parts of the Middle East. So this kind of desire to, uh, you know, people often focus on the, the caves at Lascaux and, uh, and, uh, and Chauvet, for example, which, you know, are on the order of 30,000 years ago. But as far back as you can, uh, there are evidence, and even for Neanderthals, it turns out in their, uh, in their um, graves, uh, you know, flowers are strewn. So there is some desire to decorate in a way that doesn't seem to have obvious practical, circums uh, practical uh, effects. So I think, again, to, as best we can tell, this impulse seems to be really deeply rooted in our psyche and in our prehistory. The second question about chills is something uh, that has been studied, uh, particularly in music. And uh, as you point out, not everybody gets them. Uh, people who get them, they often get them for the same pieces or transitions in music. Uh, and um, that when that has been studied, there's a group in, uh, particularly in Montreal, at the Montreal Neurologic Institute that has been really looking at this. They do find that within parts of our reward systems, and a particular part of the brain called the ventral striatum, uh, and within that an area called the nucleus accumbens, that that really fires up when people uh, subjectively report having these kinds of chill experiences. Um, there's a group in Germany that has, you know, you, you mentioned the goosebumps thing. They've been trying to develop a technology where, you know, so because scanning is extraordinarily expensive and cumbersome. But they've been uh, trying to use uh, ways in which using the way uh, light reflects off of the skin that can be altered when you have these little goosebumps and using that as a technology to try to online, you know, start having a physiologic index of exactly that feeling while people are uh, engaged in, in different kinds of experiences. But it's curious that it's much more common with music than it is with, uh, at least at, compared to, uh, to looking at paintings, for example. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is there a, taking the work that you're doing uh, and applying it to the behavior, I'm thinking specifically of the architecture of prisons, for example, or the architecture of public housing that we have done and how that would Yeah, so this, uh, it's a great question and fits into the category as I uh, mentioned in the prelude to my talk is nobody's done it, right? Uh, and I, I wanna be very clear, I mean, architects think about this and I don't wanna be naive about uh, this long tradition within architecture of thinking about this, but nobody to my knowledge has approached it the way we're trying to, which is to say that uh, you know how how do we think about uh, how do we think about our environment specifically as a means to allow humans to flourish within the constraints of what flourish means, right? I mean, if you're in a prison, there's only so much you know freedoms you can have, but you might say, what would be the conditions in which people are uh, might be less inclined to uh, be angry 
beyond their base level of anger of being confined, right? And, how, and uh, you could ask the same question about uh, schools, right? What's, what's the right environment for the right population of children that enhances learning, right? And, you know, but these are empirical questions that has, have to be addressed systematically. And, and to my knowledge, nobody's doing that in a, at least in a clear way. <laughs> thank, you. Th thank you for an interesting presentation. At this university, many students take an art appreciation class, Art 11 of 7, and in the opening chapters, they're told that certain elements of art, for example, jagged lines, can evoke certain emotions, such as anxiety, or a striking contrast between uh, black and white, the painting can make it more expressive. Has anyone confirmed these kind of basic artistic assumptions uh, using your sort of scientific techniques? I think there is some uh, evidence that actually goes back to the Gestalt psychologists on the, the jagged versus curved, uh, and that, um, that people tend to find curvilinear shapes more appealing, more approachable than jagged shapes. That specific element uh, is, we find in a variety of things, which is in our architectural studies that curvilinear interiors people tend to like more than you know, jaggedy rectilinear interiors. Um, in design of objects, if there's just a little bit of curve in it, people tend to like it more. Uh, so, you know, you can think of uh, the difference between certain computers that are very sh sharp cornered versus rounded corners. You know, cars, like that, that seems to be fairly consistent. Interestingly, there, there's at least one study I know of looking at higher primates that primates also tend to prefer slightly curvilinear shapes. So that's one I think there's a lot of data and people think this, there's something elemental about this that, that people, uh, people to like. Um, with respect to colors, uh, there is some work that I am less familiar with uh, looking across different cultures, the consistency with which people tend to prefer certain colors. Um, contrast, I don't know enough about that uh, to, to know uh, if there's any consistency to that. You know, but, but my, my general thinking is that a lot of, a lot of these um, ideas that have survived over the years through the practice of thinking about art and appreciating art are probably right, right? So, but from our point of view, that then becomes a reasonable hypothesis to be tested. Uh, and so often we start with people's intuitions, which is why, again, I think for us being, uh, having collaborations with, say, architects or artists where they say, I might not know why, but I'm pretty sure this is right. For us, that's use useful information uh, in the setting up of experiments. Excellent talk, and actually your question had a good segue for my question. Your, your answer had a good segue to my question. Uh, so we, you, you're focusing on uh, facial aesthetics and, <laughs> and beauty. Uh, in humans, and, and especially in infants, indicates there's an evolutionary foundation to facial features that we find that we're drawn to. Uh, so for other species, <coughs> humans also have a think they look at symmetry or whatever for beauty in, in animals, pets, horses, whatever. We know that uh, other species are attracted to things like plumage and, and coloration, but is there a facial uh, aesthetics that other species are attracted to or drawn to, and you know, simply in their face, as like humans? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think when people uh, look at attraction in uh, animals, for example, uh, you know, most of the focus, as, as you allude to, is in, uh, is in birds and, um, you know, and the plumage and so on. And there is stuff about symmetry of tails and things like that. Uh, Richard Prum uh, is uh, an ornithologist at Yale, I think, who's uh, about a year and a half ago uh, had a book that got a lot of uh, attention called The Evolution of Beauty. Uh, and he talks 
Uh, he talks about that. But with respect to whether animals are responding to the faces of other animals, uh, I just don't know. I did see a recent thing that is cross species uh, that uh, looked at uh, humans' response to dogs. And it turns out without realizing it, that as we've bred dogs and bred them for a certain, you know, we think of breeding them for certain looks, like whether it's a dachshund or a, you know, a greyhound, whatever. But it turns out that we have also bred dogs to have certain kinds of facial expressions. So especially the musculature around the eyes operate in a very similar way as human facial expressions. So when you think your dog is sad or whatever, that that is something that we've probably selected for to mimic the way human muscles uh, express emotions. Yeah, there's a, yeah, um, please. So my, my question kind of, this question kind of is, 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 is a comment, and um, it goes to, I just, every time someone says that like art or beauty or looking to make something aesthetically appealing has no purpose or no practical value, and I'm like, but it makes you feel good, mm -hmm. so it has enormous practical value. And actually for my master's thesis, I'm doing research on advising environment. What in the physical environment of advising makes students feel good in it, meaning more likely to, um, you know, talk to you, you know, and enjoy their advising experience and whatnot. And I guess one concept that I came upon while I was, you know, I'm still in the process of doing my research is biophilic design in architecture. Have you, are you aware of any studies or anything that looks into biophilic design, which I know just as a theory, okay, this is what, you know, if we practice architecture following these principles, that's good architecture that makes people like it. But anyone studying that in this through, you know, neuroscience, Approach. Yeah, no, it's an idea that, uh, that, as you say, has had a lot of purchase, and uh, there are some very prominent people interested in that. Uh, it has not been studied uh, in, in the way that uh, you're talking about or in the way that we would like. Uh, this, to me, would fit in the category of, as I was saying before, that, you know, there are all sorts of good reasons why very smart people think this should work, but nobody's done the study. And you know, in my mind, I'm thinking that just um, uh, last week, uh, when I had the meeting with the architects, we're now starting to talk about the interiors, like the lobby as soon as you come in, uh, and what kind of plants should we have? Like we have a courtyard that you can look right out, but you know, what what do we do with plants? Uh, and so. Those are, those are important and uh, important conversations. There's a, a, a bigger, um, or I don't know about bigger, but there's a related idea that also has a lot of uh, purchase, but for which there is unfortunately very little evidence, which is this idea that if you're out in nature, that this has a kind of restorative quality that is distinct from being in the built environment, right? It's a very appealing idea. People like being out in nature, love this idea. But it's scientifically very hard to study, right? Because nature is not, all nature is not the same. Some nature is really scary, right? You don't want to be there, right? And some interiors are really comforting. So how do you actually, like, what's, to me, the question is, what's the essential ingredient or set of ingredients, whether it's nature or the built environment, that makes us feel good. And the nature-built divide, I think, is probably not the right one. Harry. Uh, two things. Uh, one, just sharing, as you well know, there's a lot of behavioral research that supports what you're talking about and reacting to music. You're looking at it a different way, but we've got a lot of data on that, so that's great. Mm -hmm. My question is a broader question, thinking of the brain as an object, but the question is the cultural effect on how we perceive what we perceive and perceiving the same thing differently from different cultures. So just Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, and I have various thoughts about it. Um, 
So one is a, an observation with respect to art, uh, which is that in the second uh, half of the 19th century, when the Impressionists first came on the scene, right, all of the, the received wisdom was, this is crap. Why do we, you know, why should we pay attention to this? It's unimportant. It, now, if you survey Americans for what kind of art do they like the most, it's Impressionist paintings, right? Our brains haven't changed in 150 years, right? So this is really an effect of culture and exposure, right? So, and this goes back to my original slide about how art is the most variable in terms of people's preferences compared to natural kinds. The, the, but if we go to faces, uh, there's, there's a, a, another version, an, another kind of answer to your question. And this also has a interesting historic uh, antecedent. In earlier versions of my talks, I have a whole bit about that. But as new data comes in, older stuff gets thrown out. Well, um, when we think of what makes faces attractive, you know, everybody knows about symmetry. And there's some stuff about, at least for heterosexual norms, about the effects of estrogen and testosterone. But there's one called averaging. And this is something that. Uh, uh, Sir Francis Galton uh, first discovered, and he had an address to the uh, Anthropological Society of uh, England and Ireland uh, in 1868. And you can find this, his address. So for those of you who don't know who Francis Galton uh, was, he's uh, Charles Darwin's cousin. He was a polymath. He was uh, an anthropologist, an explorer. He was a statistician. A lot of the statistics we use were things that he discovered. But he was also a eugenist. And this is at a time when that didn't have quite the negative connotations it does right now. So in that framework, he thought that for this meeting, he was going to bring up uh, cutting edge technology. Uh, he was going to bring to bear cutting edge technology to a social problem. And the social problem was criminality. So he thought, how do I, if I can take photographs of convicted felons, that's the cutting edge technology, 1868, combine them, right, into a, an averaged image of all of these criminals, you would get the, the prototypic image of what a criminal is supposed to look like, right? And this would be useful for the police. So to his surprise, what he ends up with is that the face is much more attractive than any of the individual faces contributing to it, right? And in his address at the end, there's like this sense of surprise, like I wasn't expecting this. And this has been replicated many times uh, since then. So the laboratory finding is if you take 16 faces, 32 faces, uh, whatever, and now because you can digitally combine them so easily, almost invariably the combined face is more attractive than any of the individual faces contributing to it. So that's a, a straight up behavioral observation. Now, to me, what the implications of that culturally is that we are all building up prototypes of faces in our everyday lives. And that is in large part determined by the faces that we encounter. Right, so if you grow up in a monoculture, whatever that is, that's it, right? That's, that's where your prototypes are going to be built on. Whereas if you grow up in a cosmopolitan or a metropolitan area where you're seeing people of different races, different ethnicities, the whole range, you have a much richer sense of what it means to be beautiful, right? And so here, the interesting thing about this is it's a universal mechanism, right? It's a mechanism we all have. But the output of the mechanism entirely determined by our cultural exposure. Yes. Um, has there been any studies on how art, and especially music or music, affects um, autistic, excuse me, autistic children and adults, as well as uh, individuals who? Yeah, so I, I have to confess I'm less uh, knowledgeable about music than, than visual arts. Uh, there are um, 
the, there is some work in music and movement that combined in Parkinson's disease that seems to be helpful. Um, I think, um, I, I just don't know the information about autism, uh, and I don't know if some of the people who do music cognition, I'm sure there's people who have done this, I just don't know, uh, don't know the data on that. But. Yes, sir. Um, uh, when, when you were speaking about the aesthetics of villainy, um, my first thought when you mentioned Scar was say Richard III with the, the hunchback. Mm -hmm. uh, does, is, is that in, this, in the same uh, uh, wheelhouse? Is, uh, does the, the facial deformity have a, a stronger impact or a different, very different message than say uh, a physical deformity in the, uh, the body? I, I, in my mind, those would be all part of the same thing, right? Is that you show, you show someone who uh, is and we've been consciously using the word anomaly rather than disfigurement so that we don't reinforce that idea. But you know, you show someone who is physically altered, right, and that the implication is that they're also mentally altered. Uh, and I, I think that's a kind of standard thing. Um, there is, uh, uh, I recently found out that there is a, uh, an organization that's primarily based in the United Kingdom called the Facial Equality, FEI, Equality, I can't remember what the I stands for. But this is a, a nonprofit organization who is, uh, that's agenda is to really promote uh, or bring to awareness these kinds of systematic biases that people have anyway and then how the media promotes that. And they're trying to bring it uh, to the UN and other uh, large social organizations to have it classified among the category of discrimination and disabilities uh, uh, along those lines. Have you done any research with mise-en-scene within film aesthetics and how manipulates viewers' rankings? Yeah, so the, 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 there are people who are looking at uh, narration of different kinds, whether it's literature or film, uh, and we haven't done any of that work. I, I do believe mise-en-scene is like the lighting, placement of objects, um, Yeah, so we haven't done we haven't done that in uh, in any systematic way uh, with respect to, I mean, you know, so some some stuff with this the architecture work that we're doing we're thinking about that, about, so, you know, even questions of uh, how daylight affects people, right? So again, in this context, it's people with memory problems, and some of you may know, especially later in the afternoon, people tend to get agitated, and can that be modulated? There are some firms that are actually working on lighting in places that follow circadian rhythms as an example of trying to use light uh, to offset uh, behaviors that are predictable uh, at a population level. But again, very little work on that. Um, I think there was a question. Jeff. Oh. Yeah, uh, this is going up in a uh, comment you made earlier that uh, a villain may be ugly on the outside to indicate to the viewer that they're ugly on the inside. and so. You've shown an appreciation of beauty, and we can measure that, an appreciation of ugliness, and how we can appreciate that. And my question is, we have an appreciation of ugliness, uh, an appreciation of ugliness that is positive. And so to throw out an example of that, because I think it may have to do with the aptness of the correlation, like the ugly on the outside, the ugly on the inside, something like the right of spring, something that is heavily dissonant music, which is paired with music that is distinctly non-classical pigeon code punched over, in that the plot of the right of spring is quite act by uneducated rural people correlates with this idea of dissonant, dissonant music being paired with um, bad dancing. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm hoping to be able to uh, summarize the question. <laughs> uh, to summarize it, uh, is 
ugliness, which is what correlated with other media? So if you have something that is ugly, say a villain, yeah. and the audience is like, oh, that ugly person is probably ugly on the inside, I like the fact that that was communicated to me. There's an appreciation of the fact that they are prepared and correlated. Um. Or it'd be ridiculous to have a, a um, hero that was incredibly ugly, um, or a or it, that was coming out of a hero who was incredibly ugly, or a villain who was incredibly yeah. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, so even the notion of anti-heroes maybe gets at some of that of sort of playing with those uh, those uh, discordances. Um, yeah, I don't. I yeah, I, I don't have any intuitions about that. I mean, you know, the one thing uh, there there is, you know, there is a way in which this beauty is good axis we think, although we haven't studied this, also works in the opposite direction, right? Which is if someone, you think someone is good, they start to look more attractive. Uh, and I think this maybe comports with most people's experience where you, know, you meet someone for the first time in a party or some social setting, you don't know anything about them, you have an immediate impression whether you think they're good looking or not. You get to know them and based on what they're like, right? You, they're a jerk or they're a great person. The experience is that they physically seem to change, right? Perceptually, they seem either more or less attractive, right? So I think this works both ways. Uh, but the discordance question you're asking, I'm not so sure about. Uh, Umberto Eco has a book just called On Ugliness, where he goes through a lot of this, uh, but in his case, or, or at least in this book, what he mostly talks about is how uh, even the designation of what is ugly ha is often used as a social cudgel, so that it's a means of oppression to label certain things ugly uh, and to other them accordingly. So we have two questions, Lara, and then I'll come back to you. Lara. So to get back to the culture and views that you're investigating, and also to the anomalous spaces, I study ancient American art, and especially I'm thinking about in the Americas, there are many images of people with what we have also say anomalous bodies or faces. So someone with scoliosis or scars from the scoliosis, and they're missing parts of their face, and they become the spiritual leaders in those communities, and they're looked up to. And these are beautiful artworks from Moche and Peru and the Chichon peoples of Colombia and Costa Rica. And I just am wondering your subjects. I mean, you said you have Spanish people from Spain and the U.S. Do you ever try to see if maybe other cultures see that differently? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we, uh, I have a collaborator at Penn who um, uh, studies nomadic tribes in Tanzania, particularly the Hazda, which is a group that has been looked at. And, uh, you know, she sends her grad student or postdoc out there. They get in a Land Rover. They're out, you know, driving around, you know, tracking uh, some of these small clusters of nomadic uh, people and are doing, um, uh, you know, do behavioral studies with them. So it's a culture that's right on the edge. There's a little bit of contact with the, the uh, with Western uh, or uh, Western cultures, but not a lot. And uh, just this past summer, we did a study with them uh, asking this question, exactly the same question of whether they have a similar kind of response uh, to these anomalous faces. Uh, I don't know what it showed. Uh, I mean, he just came back uh, a few weeks ago, so I don't know what the data are. Uh, but it, there are also some real challenges of doing that kind of work because, you know, this population is not particularly used to being asked these kinds of questions and you, you can only get a few responses in a way that we might get 50 responses in a lab to be certain about the, uh, so there are certainly challenges of doing it, but that's the one area where we've tried to, to address this. Um, Your question. Um, so, in your empathy, the lack of empathy um, study, were you showing just female faces? 
to whom were you showing the face? faces? Were they just females? And did you see the same effects for females looking at females versus males looking at males in the late quadrant? Yeah. So, you know, there are shown faces of both men and women, and the participants are men and women. Uh, yeah, we, we're not powered to answer that question. Uh, you know, so part of it is that imaging experiments are extraordinarily expensive. So that one study was probably $20,000, right? Uh, so we're not powered to do that. However, in the behavioral studies, right, where they're not in a scanner, just the implicit association test, what we see consistently is that men have more of a negative bias than women do when looking at faces, regardless of the gender. We'll take one more question. Yes, sir. Thank you for your lecture, sir. Um, it's more of a, um, I'm wondering, the follow-up study that you plan on doing uh, for the, the face study that you're doing, what, ex what information do you plan on getting out of that? Because I think you said that you also think that um, certain aesthetic responses can lead to a dehumanization response also. Yeah, so and this is a timely question because I'm actually uh, submitting a grant in the first week of February to lay out some of what we want to do. So we, we have a bunch of questions which are, uh, what are the nature of faces that predispose to this? What, what is the nature of the people who are looking at this that predispose to these kinds of responses? And then the further question is, okay, we see these responses and these subtle uh, effects on people's motor behavior through these reaction time experiments. But does this actually make a difference in how people treat others, right? Those are the set of questions. So with respect to the faces, we wanna know, does it make a difference if the face, if the anomaly is something that is acquired or something genetic, right? So if you get a burn versus uh, something uh, like a port wine stain, that covers the same part of the face, right? But one is genetic, one is acquired. Does it make a difference or does it not make a difference? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. With respect to people looking at this, uh, I mentioned the, the discuss questionnaires, but there are others we're looking at as well, which is there's something that looks at uh, the notion of egalitarianism, that there are some people who think that uh, people get what they deserve, right? This is a just world, right? And some people think, no, shit happens. Like, you know, it, you just, you can't control this stuff, right? But people vary on that. So the question is, if you really think that this is a just world and, and people get what they deserve, maybe you have less empathy. We don't know if that's true or not, but that's the kind of question we're asking. And then the broader question of does this actually affect people's behavior, how do you study that? So what we're looking at is that there are these uh, games that have been, laboratory games that have been developed in behavioral economics and neuroeconomics where you're uh, testing for how generous someone is to another person in very constrained ways. Like, are you fair with someone? You know, so they're the kind of experiments that, uh, this is a very simple experiment that has been studied a lot where I give you 10 bucks, right? You have to give me some money, right? I don't tell you how much money to give me, but based on what you give me, I'm going to either accept or reject the offer. If I reject the offer, neither of us get any money. If I accept it, whatever you decided you're gonna get, I'm gonna get it, right? So the strictly rational economist would say, if I'm the recipient, out of 10 bucks, if you give me one buck, I should say yes, because I started with nothing and I got a buck, right? So whatever, I, whatever you offer me, I'm better off than I was before. That's not how people work. The threshold seems to be about three or four. If you give me less than three, I'm saying no way. And so neither of us get anything, right? So we put a monetary value on fairness, right? And this has been worked out. So now the question is, in these situations, if you think you're the person you're working with in a variety of these kinds of games, has these kinds of facial anomalies, are you, does this change how you behave uh, in these kinds of games? So that's the way we're trying to take these observations and really move them forward. 
So folks, we, we've run out of time, but clearly the conversation could continue. This is fascinating material. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Chatterjee. Let's give him a round of applause.